Well, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning, and I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open it to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. We'll read there in just a few moments, Matthew chapter 2. I hope you're already planning to be with us next Sunday, Christmas Day. We're going to have two worship services, one at 9 o'clock at the Madison Street campus, and then we'll also have a 10 o'clock service here at the Family Life Center. And so I hope you'll make every effort to be a part of those services. They're usually very well attended when we gather on Christmas Day. I think it's going to be a great day to gather. I mean, we talk a lot about Christ and Christmas and keeping Christ in Christmas. I can't imagine a more Christ-focused way to celebrate Christmas than to be with God's people in God's house and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, who was that baby born in Bethlehem. That's next Sunday. And tell your friends, we try to do the timing so that you can get up and do the gifts, but still get to grandma's on time. And uh, that's, that's coming up next week. If I had to guess, I would say that all of us, certainly most of us, have heard, we wish you a Merry Christmas by now. But despite the images and the sounds of Christmas cheer we encounter in stores and magazines and on TV and radio, Christmas is often bittersweet for some financial pressures or a recent death or family drama or traumatic memories of Christmas's past. Any or all of those can come to a head during the holidays like few other times during the year. I mean, we hear Buddy the Elf say, and we want to believe the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. But we can't seem to find our song. If any of that resonates with you, I wanna say something to you on the front end of this message. You are not alone. Not only are there others who feel the same way as you, no one understands more than God. He created you, he hardwired you emotionally, so yes, he understands, but he understands on another level because the road to Bethlehem is not without tragedy. That's what we're talking about today. The road to Bethlehem is not without tragedy. Contrary to most of our Christmas carols and cards, if we listen, really listen, we can hear cries in the distance as we near this little town of Bethlehem. My Christmas sermon series this year revolves around Bethlehem. I imagine Joseph asking people, this is a hypothetical question, but I imagine Joseph asking people along the way as he and Mary are making that 90 mile journey between Nazareth and Bethlehem. I imagine Joseph asking along the way, do you know the way to Bethlehem? Maybe when they're at a, a T in the road or a fork in the road, do you know the way to Bethlehem? I mean, he has a sense of the general direction, but do you know the way to Bethlehem? Now, we know what awaited them there, but only in hindsight would Joseph and Mary really re be able to reflect upon the magnitude of the majesty and the miracle that they were privileged to have front row seats to. But really more than that, they were on the court. They were in the game. They were key players in the Christmas story. And so it was more than important. It was imperative that they get there. Do you know the way to Bethlehem? Thus far, we've talked about history, prophecy, mystery on our way to Bethlehem. But I would be remiss if I fail to include that the road to Bethlehem is not without tragedy. We began this series in the book of Ruth, as you recall, and we talked about how tragedy struck Naomi's family when her husband and both sons died, leaving her and two daughters-in-law widows. And Naomi, whose name means pleasantness, didn't think she should be called Naomi anymore. She asked instead to be called Mara or Mara, bitterness because she interpreted her circumstances and misery as God dealing bitterly with her. But sometimes 
The only explanation for what happens in our lives is that life happens. Imperfect life in a broken, sinful world happens. It just happens, bringing pain and grief, but life happens. That's one example of tragedy on the road to Bethlehem. But that was more than 1,100 years before the birth of Christ. And so let's move closer much closer. Normally, we would talk about the magi, the wise men on the other side of Christmas since they arrived after Jesus was born. Now, I know, I know, our nativity sets have the wise men standing right beside the shepherds there by the manger with baby Jesus in it. We, we do our manger scenes and our manger sets like that, but In reality, the wise men showed up after Jesus was born. There's no question about that. They did not join the shepherds at the manger in the stable. We are absolutely confident of that. In fact, let's begin reading in Matthew chapter two, beginning in verse one, and you'll see immediately why we can be so certain of that. We'll read through verse 18. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi, wise men, Magi from the east, arrived in Jerusalem saying, now let me pause there. How long after Jesus was born did the Magi arrive? We don't know exactly. We do know from Ezra chapter seven, verse nine in the Old Testament that it took Ezra and his caravan four months to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, if the Magi traveled at the same rate as Ezra, that would mean at the earliest, the wise men arrived about four months after Jesus was born. But it could have taken months or longer to prepare for the trip. We don't know how long after Jesus was born that they began the journey that would take four months. And so we don't know how long after the birth of Christ they arrived. Now we'll see later that it was certainly under two years. And so we we know that it was at the earliest four months after Jesus was born, but at most two years. Verse two, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? This is the question that they're asking. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So here we have the wise men walking through town asking people where their king had been born. And the Magi must have been so surprised that no one knew what they were talking about. Verse three, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. That's that's what Matthew says. He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Now here's here's the scene. In all likelihood, the wise men arrived with an armed escort. You'll see on Christmas cards and in the movies, the wise men riding into town on camels. We have no proof that they were riding on camels. Uh, We we don't know how they arrived exactly. But, But however they traveled, they would have been accompanied by an armed escort. Considering their prestige, the, their, their status in society, the value of the gifts that they were bringing to this newborn king, and the fact that they were entering into Roman-occupied territory as outsiders, oh yeah, they would have definitely had armed protection. Herod was already paranoid. This is a well-documented fact in, in, in secular and Jewish history. Herod was already paranoid. He killed one of his 10 wives, a mother-in-law, two brothers-in-law, and three of his many sons because he did not trust them. And so when a group like the Magi showed up with armed guards asking for the newborn king of the Jews, a title that Herod held, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Well, Herod was troubled. That word literally means deeply disturbed. Or if I revert back to my native tongue of the Hardin County, Tennessee dialect, he was tore up. (laughs) He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. 
And Herod, no doubt, saw the occasion and their presence, their question, their quest as a potential coup. And so here we have paranoid, some have gone as far as to say insane, King Herod thinking somebody's trying to take my throne. But he didn't get to where he was without being politically savvy. And so verse four, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, and, and can I just note that, and, and, and you, don't, you don't have these words in the text, you understand, but, but it's as if they didn't miss a beat. They knew the details. They, they knew where, they, they, they could quote the passage, and yet there was nothing on their radar. You've got, you've got people from a foreign land, non-Jews, who potentially are, are completely pagan, coming looking for Messiah who, who has been born, and yet those who should have been expecting him most didn't even have him on their radar. But they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Herod, of course, had no intention of worshiping he who has been born king of the Jews. He was trying to manipulate the wise men into revealing the location of the Christ child so he could kill him. He had no intention of bowing the knee to Jesus. Verse nine, after hearing the king, they went their way and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now the scripture says the wise men fell to the ground and worshiped Jesus. They prostrated themselves in a posture of surrendered worship. And in that spirit of worship, they gave him worship offerings, gifts worthy of a king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's the number of gifts that have le- has led many of us, most of us, to assume that there were three wise men. But there's no reason to believe that there were three wise men or only three wise men or as many as three wise men. There, there could have been less than or more than three, but the gifts they brought to Jesus were number three. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, immediately in our minds, because we're less familiar with frankincense and myrrh, we think, wow, I wonder how much gold there was in that gift that they gave to Jesus. But in truth, in the, in the, in the ancient world, frankincense and myrrh were extremely valuable too. In fact, I read an article in Smithsonian Magazine that it, it was just talking about um, how useful frankincense and myrrh were in the ancient world. But that article said that gold might have been the least valuable of the three gifts that the wise men brought Jesus. (laughs) Isn't that something? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, each one in its own right, very valuable. The point is, though, the Magi gave Jesus gifts worth a great deal of money, which might seem strange considering Jesus was just a baby or a toddler. What did he need with gold, frankincense, and myrrh? We might find our answer in just a a moment. Verse 12, and having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. They didn't tell Herod 
where he could find Jesus. They didn't tell, they didn't report to Herod anything. They received this message from God in a dream. They heeded that message. They left town without telling the fearful, paranoid King Herod anything. They disappeared. Verse 13, now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. This trip to Egypt that commenced in the middle of the night lasted for at least months, perhaps years. And you can imagine that Joseph and Mary needed resources to survive. How would they make it in this foreign land among strangers? And yet by God's providence, they had more than enough in the gifts the Magi gave Jesus. The Lord provided Before they even knew they needed provision, the Lord provided. But back to Bethlehem. Here's where the story turns especially tragic. Then when Herod, this is verse 16. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. This act of unimaginable cruelty and evil is known as the massacre of the innocents. Herod would do anything to protect his position, even kill babies in hopes of eliminating what he saw as a potential threat to his throne. Now, how many boys did Herod order to be killed? We, we, we don't know that number. We're not sure. I can tell you that uh, there are some incredible numbers floating out there. There are some particular religious traditions that put the number in excess of 10,000. But uh, 10, 15,000 uh, babies and, and toddlers. But considering that Bethlehem in that day had probably no more than 1,500 people. I'm not exactly sure where they pulled those numbers from. Uh, In reality, considering how small Bethlehem was at that point in time, there were probably no more than a couple dozen boys that were killed, maybe half that number. But even one is too many, and only one is tragic. Sometimes those who reject the biblical record, though, they will argue that there's nothing in secular history that confirms the massacre of the innocents. And they say, well, that proves that this never happened. But that's actually an argument from from silence. And an argument from silence is always a weak argument. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And so the biblical record attests to this fact. You say, well, well, pastor, I mean, just think through that. I mean, if you're looking at it from the outside, well, let me tell you what I think about that. Herod brutally and ruthlessly murdered on a whim, killing family, sometimes killing masses of people. And so historians would not have taken note of him ordering a few kids killed, especially if those murders happened in the middle of the night. I said earlier that Jesus was at least four months old when the Magi arrived. I think he was older than that. But this is the verse, verse 16, that suggests he could have been as much as two years old because Herod ordered all the male children in Bethlehem and his vicinity, two years old and younger, to be murdered, to be killed, according to the time that he established with the Magi. Now, Jesus could have been as much as two years old. He was probably less than two, honestly. But Herod ordered all the male children two years old and younger to be killed because he didn't know exactly how old Jesus was. He didn't know who Jesus was and he didn't know how old Jesus was. And so he was taking no chances. 
But can you, can you even begin to imagine the shock and the horror and the grief as parents filled with bountiful joy, one moment holding the lifeless bodies of their children the next? And why? Did they even know why Herod ordered such an act of cruelty? Did they have any idea why their precious child was now dead? Verses 17 and 18. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. In the original context of that quotation, Jeremiah 31, 15, by the way, the prophet Jeremiah was lamenting mothers in Judah, personified as Rachel, Rachel, Jacob's wife, whom he buried on the side of the road in Bethlehem when she died. Mothers in Judah crying as their sons were taken off in Babylonian captivity. But Matthew applies those same words to mothers in the first century. Mothers in first century Israel who wailed in unspeakable anguish because Herod killed their babies. And Rachel wept for her children. Rachel, whose grave was right there in Bethlehem. Honestly, I, I wish from beginning to end that the Christmas story was filled with smiles and laughter and moments that make you feel all warm on the inside. But the road to Bethlehem is not without tragedy. Terrible, monstrous, outrageous, barbaric tragedy. But what are we supposed to do with that? What, what are we supposed to do with the fact that such evil, I mean, I, I, as God is doing this, this miracle, this miracle of incarnation, when God would become invisible, God would become a visible human being. As God was performing this miracle, how could this evil happen? What are we supposed to do with that? Jesus told a story once about a man who sowed wheat in his fields. But in the night, an enemy came and sowed tares. Tares are a form of weed that looks like wheat in its infancy when it's young. But once the tares were visible, the man's servants came and asked if they should go through the fields and pull up all the tares. But the man said, no, don't do that. Because in pulling up the weeds, you're gonna end up pulling up the wheat. And so just let them both grow together and we'll separate them in the end. Jesus, with that story, was helping us, he, he was talking in ancient times, but he was helping us with some contemporary uh, issues and problems because he was acknowledging that the world that we live in is broken, woefully, sinfully, tragically broken. And the choices that Adam and Eve made in the garden have spread sin and multiplied misery and we are living in the compounding consequences of their choices and ours too, to this day. But, but, but pastor, there, there is still some good in the world. And I agree with you about that. But whatever good is in the world, this world that we live in, shares the same root system as the bad. Our humanity. And to pull up evil by its roots like a weed would destroy all the good as well. And so God in his infinite wisdom and his sovereignty, even in his mercy, allows both to coexist until that time when he will separate the two. So in the meantime, God chose redemption as his plan. And despite the tragedy that surrounded the birth of Christ, 
despite the, the tears, the sorrow, the suffering, the tragedy that surrounded the birth of Christ. Christ was born. Just when we thought that it might be over, Christ was born. He survived. Verse 19 of our text, we didn't read it, but it echoes something we read earlier in the text. It tells us that Herod died. I think it's interesting that immediately after the text we read, we read of Herod's death. And I have no doubt that he died believing he succeeded in killing the baby born king of the Jews in Bethlehem. But he failed. Herod tried to frustrate and foil God's plan, but he failed. Just as the Lord promised in Psalm 2, a messianic psalm by the way, In verse two of that psalm, the psalmist writes, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Remember, Messiah and Christ both mean anointed one. But then verse four says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. The Lord is not troubled or swayed. He's not afraid of those who would mock him, those who would taunt him, those who would try to oppose him. The psalmist goes on to describe the certainty of the coming king's rule and reign. That's the power of God. That's the authority of God. Herod failed. God's purpose, God's plan always moves forward. It's like the example I gave in that first message of this series. If you step into a river, you'll displace some water where you're standing, but the river continues to move in the same direction. That river is like God's purpose, God's plan. It continues to move. You make all the splashes you want, but God's still going to accomplish his purpose and his plan. This was not the first time Satan attempted to prevent Christ's birth and failed. In fact, I preached a sermon on Christmas Eve a few years ago um, where where I talked about that that, that very issue. You know, as I think about that sermon, the other pastors still make fun of me about that sermon. I called that sermon, the dragon who tried to eat Jesus from Revelation 12. And I talked in that message about how From the Garden of Eden forward, Satan attempted repeatedly to prevent God's promises of Messiah from coming to pass. Cain and Abel, Joseph and his brothers, Saul and David, David and Goliath, and many, many, many other examples from the scriptures that testify to this fact that Satan was attempting to prevent these promises from coming to pass. I still stand by that sermon. Pastors, I still stand by that sermon. I do have to confess that I I, I probably could have chosen a more family-friendly, child-friendly title for Christmas Eve, you know, this family-oriented time. I could probably have chosen a better title than the dragon who tried to eat Jesus because I'm fairly certain none of those children had 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 heard that title on a Charlie Brown's Christmas. I still like that title though. Let me say this in, in all seriousness. The birth of Christ was the ultimate declaration of war. War against the devil, war against the hellish evil he inflames. The birth of Jesus was a bomb dropped into the heart of enemy territory. As John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. And so whatever tranquility we might imagine Bethlehem held when Christ was born, silent night, holy night, Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. 
whatever, whatever quietness and meekness and tranquility that we imagine Bethlehem as sirens were blaring in the spiritual realm as Satan and his minions scrambled for cover. And so it should not surprise us that Satan would express a retaliatory hostility against God because Jesus had been born. But what are we to do with this? What are we to do with the tragedy associated with the birth of Christ? Especially something this heinous, this horrible. See it for what it is. What are we to do with it? See it for what it is. Another example in a long chain of examples of Satan's hostility against God. The evil Herod perpetrated on innocent children and their families was really the devil's hopeless attempt to fight back against God delivering on his promises. So see it for what it is. Satan's futile effort to thwart the hand of God. Now listen, in the real world, evil is real. Sometimes in our church cocoon, we act as if evil were theoretical. We act like it's in some other dimension and it never really touches the dimension we live in. But in the real world, evil is real. Choices have consequences. So evil choices have evil consequences. But God the Son took on the flesh and form of our humanity as a baby born in Bethlehem so he could become the cure for our sin. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So let me encourage you. Don't let the evil of our spiritual enemy keep you from believing. Let the goodness and faithfulness of God bring you to faith in Christ. Satan will whisper in your ear and try to convince you that any God who would sit by and allow something so horrible to happen can't possibly be a God you could trust. When in reality, that same devil who's whispering those words in your ear is the one who incited those very actions. Our God continued with the hope continued with the salvation that he promised to deal with that very kind of evil in time, but ultimately in the end. And so once again, don't let the evil of our spiritual enemy keep you from believing. Let the goodness and faithfulness of God bring you to faith in Christ. If you don't have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, would you give your heart to Christ today? This Jesus, he came into the world as a baby, but he didn't stay a baby. I know that with our Christmas decorations, we put out the little plastic baby Jesus in the plastic manger, and, and, and then we put him back up in the attic, and next year when we pull all that stuff out, he's still gonna be baby Jesus, and we're gonna put him in that plastic manger. Next year, it's all gonna be the same, but I wanna tell you, that baby Jesus didn't stay a baby. He grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God. Man, he grew. He grew to be a man, who one day would lay down his carpenter's hammer and would step out and begin to teach and to preach the good news of the kingdom. But that good news was so offensive to those who were so entrenched in their unrighteousness that they eventually killed him. To silence him, they killed him. But what they did not understand was that in killing him, they were actually carrying out God's eternal plan that he would Jesus would die in our place. He took upon himself our sin, the punishment for our sin, and he died in our place. They took his lifeless body down from the cross, put it in a tomb, but by Sunday morning, he was alive. He got up and walked out of that tomb. That's the good news of Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the power, the penetrating power of the gospel. Believe in him. Believe in the gospel and be saved. For those of us who are already born again, we need to be challenged today as well. To not lose sight of all of the evil that is in the world. 
But we also don't need to lose sight of the evil that is in our own hearts. It's easy for us to talk about the speck in somebody else's eye and ignore the logs in our own. And so even as we seek to change the world, even as we want to make a dent and a difference in the world for Jesus, we need to realize that there is evil in our own hearts that has to be dealt with. And so perhaps today is a day when those who don't yet know Jesus will come and bow before Jesus like the wise men and offer to Jesus the very best they have. Perhaps some today will do that in salvation. Others of us need to revisit that that, that, that worship, that posture of worship and bow before the Lord Jesus too and give him the best that we have. I'm gonna pray when I say amen. We'll stand and we'll sing a song. And let me encourage you to use that song as an opportunity to do business with God. There will be at least one pastor standing to my right, to your left, maybe more than one, who would love today to help you take your next step with God. Now, the information will be on the screen. You can respond electronically. We'll be in touch very soon. But you can talk to somebody this morning, today, if you'd like. And we'd love that chance. So I'm gonna pray when I say amen. We'll stand, we'll sing, and you come. Gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that in the midst of tragedy, you're still at work, carrying out, accomplishing your divine purposes and plan. And so, Father, I pray that we'll be able to, to see the big picture, to look beyond the circumstances, look beyond the pain. And Lord, for some of us, that's gonna be harder than for others. And Lord, I pray that for those who carry perpetual pain, they, they wear wounds deeply. Lord, I pray that you would be merciful and gracious to them. And Lord, I pray that this Christmas season would be a, a, a time of hope as they contemplate your goodness, your faithfulness. Lord, have your will and way here today. Save those who need to be saved. Reclaim those of us who have wandered from the fold. And Lord, in the end, may we be like the Magi, prostrated before Jesus, offering the very best gift that we can give him. And Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You come.